This evening, we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Nehemiah. And with this as the focus, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. And as you're making your way to the 10th chapter of Nehemiah, well, I just want to take a moment to remind you that Nehemiah was the man that the Lord raised up to go and rebuild the defensive wall there in Jerusalem. And in this way, the people of God could safely serve the Lord there at the temple without fear of their enemies. And once the walls were rebuilt and after the defensive doors were hung in their places, the people of God were then encouraged to go and rededicate their lives to the Lord by submitting themselves to the Mosaic law. Well, uh, for the sake of clarity, as I talk about the Mosaic law, we're also talking about the Mosaic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant was the conditional contract that the Lord made with Moses on the day when he promised to turn the nation of Israel into a kingdom of priests as well as a holy nation. And while it's true that God was committing himself to the people of Israel, well, it's also true that this covenant included the conditional qualifier which required the nation of Israel to walk in obedience according to the Mosaic law. Well, as we saw in our study last week, the people of Israel were constantly contravening the Mosaic Covenant, and it's for this reason that the Lord would punish them for their acts of disobedience. But then whenever they would repent and whenever they would return to the Lord, well, the Lord would then receive them and restore them to their place of prominence as the people of God. And with that being the case, Ezra encouraged the people to recommit themselves to the Mosaic Covenant. And it's in the final verse. Uh, it's, it's in the final verse of chapter 9 where Nehemiah tells us that the people made a sure covenant which was confirmed and sealed by their leaders, their Levites, as well as their priests. Well now, here in our text tonight, we're going to consider the way that the people were then instructed to keep this covenant. And as we make our way through this incredible chapter, we're also going to consider how the commitments that the Israelites made with the Lord well, they ought to be applied to our lives here in the church age in, in, in a similar yet in a different way. And we'll consider that as we continue to make our way through this chapter. And with this as the focus, if you would, let's turn our attentions now to the text before us tonight. Look with me there, Nehemiah chapter 10. We're going to begin reading there at verse 1. Here we learn that those who placed their seal on the document were Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah, Sarahiah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malchijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Maluk, Haram, Meramoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Gineathon, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, Majamin, Maaziah, Bilgai, and Shemaiah. These were the priests. The Levites, Yeshua, the son of Azaniah, Benui of the sons of Henadad and Cadmiel. Their brethren, Shebaniah, Hodijah, Kalita, Pelaiah, Hannah, Micah, Rehob, Hashhabiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodijah, Bani, and Beninu. The leaders of the people, Parash, Pahath, Moab, Elam, Zatu, and Bani, Buni, Asgad, and Babai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Adin, Adder, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodijai, Hashem, Bezai, Herif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezir, Meshezabel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Ananiah, Hoshia, Hananiah, Hashab, Halahesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehom, Hashabana, Maasiah, Ahijah, Hannah, Anan, Maluk, Haram, and Baana. Well, here in the beginning of this chapter, we start off with such an interesting list of names, which you know probably are pronounced very differently than what I just presented. When I get to heaven, I'll have a whole lot of people to say I'm sorry to. But as we consider this recorded list of leaders, you know, who placed their seal upon this document of rededication, we can see how, you know, these were the people who were basically representing the rest of Israel. And in this way, these leaders of Israel were setting their seal of approval 
upon their decision to rededicate themselves to the Mosaic Covenant. And after setting their seal upon this document, the people were then instructed to make an oath before the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, let's pick up our study of Nehemiah chapter 10. We'll begin reading there at verse 28. Here we learn that the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our, our, uh, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. And here in these verses, we find Ezra helping the people to gain a greater understanding of this covenant. And he did this by instructing the people to enter into a curse and an oath as they prepared to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord. And you might be wondering here, well, why in the world would the Lord want his people to enter into an oath and a curse. Like, why, why is he leading them to enter into this oath and curse? And in order to answer this question, I want to consider the way that Moses led the people in the same sort of ceremony. And, and, and the account is actually found in Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28. It's there where Moses commanded six tribes of Israel to go and stand on Mount Gerizim. And it's there where the Levites then proclaimed all of the blessings that the Lord was promising to pour out on his people who were keeping the covenant. At the same time, Moses also sent the other six tribes to stand on Mount Ebal, and it was there where the Levites proclaimed the curses which would come upon those who failed to keep the covenant of the Lord. I'll give you an example here. It's in Deuteronomy 27 where the Levites declared this, cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen and sets it upon, uh, up in secret and all the people shall answer and say, amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt, and all the people shall say, amen. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, amen. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road, and all the people shall say, amen. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice due uh, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law. And all the people shall say, you guessed it, Amen. Here in these verses, you know, we find this list of curses which would come upon the nation of Israel if they failed to keep their covenant with the Lord. If they broke these laws, then the, the curse of God would come upon them. At the same time, the Lord also presented them with blessings that they could enjoy if they would simply keep the ordinances of the Mosaic law. As a matter of fact, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Here the Levites also declare this, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flock, which will cause global warming. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, this is... This is uh, the wrong version. <laughs> blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and blessed shall be, uh, you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. 
Incredible. And as we consider this list of blessings, we can see here that the Mosaic Covenant, well, it was a conditional contract. The Mosaic Covenant was a conditional contract. You see, if the nation of Israel kept the covenant, well, they'd be blessed. And if they contravened the covenant, then they would be cursed. So the choice was theirs. It's not that God was changing his mind. It's that his response to the people's decision would be different. As we consider the way that Moses led the people to enter into this curse and oath as they made this covenant with the Lord, well, we can also be certain that Ezra was following suit. He was also, in the same way, leading the people to enter into the same agreement as the post-exilic Israelites rededicated themselves to this Mosaic covenant. In this way, Ezra was actually helping them to grasp the conditional aspects of the Mosaic covenant. And listen, it's in a similar sort of way that those who embrace uh, the new covenant, which is received by faith in Jesus Christ, will also do well to realize that this covenant includes relational reciprocity, which uh, will result in blessings for those who walk by faith, but also loving correction for the backsliding believer. Yeah, there, there is conditional aspects to this covenant as well. Those who walk by faith with the Lord Jesus Christ will be blessed. And those who backslide, well, they're gonna be corrected. I like the way that Paul put it in Galatians chapter six. It's there where he declares, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. In other words, the believers who are sowing spiritual seeds into the soil of their lives, they're going to begin to produce everlasting fruits which we will enjoy forevermore. Conversely, the Christians who sow sinful seeds into the soil of their lives, they're going to begin to produce the fleshly fruits of carnal corruption. You better believe that this will have a negative impact on our lives as the Lord begins to correct us. Well, in order to further make my case here, let's continue to make our way through Nehemiah chapter 10. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 30. Here Nehemiah writes, we would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. If the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. And here in these verses, we find the Israelites, they're again recommitting themselves to the law regarding you know, everything that the Lord had said, and, and, and here we find them you know, recommitting themselves to the, uh, uh, the, the law regarding marriages with unbelievers. And just to be clear, this law wasn't based on a rejection of Gentile races. Any Gentile could, you know, convert and become an Israelite, and, and then they could marry into the nation of Israel. So this wasn't a rejection of Gentiles as a race, but instead this was a rejection of the Gentile religions. To prove my point, let's consider the law that the Lord revealed back in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Here Moses declares, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Here in these verses, we see that God wasn't opposed necessarily to interracial marriages. No one said he was opposed to interreligious marriages. And the purpose of this marital prohibition was to protect the hearts of his people. Because when you know, the, the person who is serving the Lord begins to you know, uh, make a, a marital covenant with someone who's not serving the Lord, well, that, that yoke with another person is stronger 
than uh, the yoke that we have with the God that we can't see. And so it's so, it's so important for us to understand that, it, that God's not against interracial marriages. He's against interreligious marriages. And the Lord has called unmarried Christians to avoid the unequal yoking that occurs whenever believers make a marital covenant with an unbeliever. You know, if you're a believer and, and you know, you're married to an unbeliever, you know, and, and chances are, you know, you were both unbelievers and then maybe one of you became a believer along the way. Listen, I'm not, I'm not necessarily addressing that issue. What I'm talking about is the unmarried Christian who, who is, you know, scanning the field, swiping right on an unbeliever, if you will, and, and you know, determining I'm going to pursue this relationship with this unbeliever. If you're single and you're looking for that special someone to spend the rest of your life with, you should realize that the Christian who marries an unbeliever is going to end up being unequally yoked with a person who very well could turn your heart away from the Lord. It's for this reason that I encourage every Christian parent to raise their children with this sort of understanding. And you know, we could get into to, to, you know, a, a nice long debate about you know, whether dating is a biblical concept or not. I'm of the opinion that it's not. You know, but listen, if you're a parent who allows their children to go on dates, well, you ought to look into that relationship. You ought to make sure that if you do allow that sort of practice, that they're actually you know, interested in a believer and not an unbeliever. And listen, everyone says they're a believer. You know, everyone says they're a Christian. So I'm not, I'm not even talking about, yo, well, they say they're a Christian. Yeah, really? What, what church they go to? How are they serving at that church? How are they thought of at that church? You ought to look into that and help your kids to make those kinds of decisions. Listen, it, it, you know, the last thing that you want, parent, is for your child to grow up and marry someone who ends up leading them away from the Lord because they're not a believer. In this way, we can see how you know, there are spiritual blessings when a believer marries another believer. But there are also consequences and complications whenever a believer marries an unbeliever, and the Lord would spare you of that. It's for this reason that the Israelites, as they recommitted them, themselves to the Lord, uh, as, as, they re, re, as they recommitted themselves to the Lord, that, uh, they also recommitted themselves to the law regarding interreligious marriages. And so they separated themselves away uh, from uh, the unbelievers. We should also notice how the people recommitted themselves to the restrictions regarding the Sabbath. And if you would notice uh, again there in verse 31, here, Nehemiah declares, if the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. Now, here in these verses, we find the Israelites, they're recommitting themselves now to the Sabbath laws, and this not only included the prohibitions against, you know, shopping on the Sabbath, but this also included the rest that was required for every holy day. Uh, furthermore, the Sabbath laws also required them to, uh, you know, to let the land rest every seventh year. They were allowed to work the land for six years, but then every seventh year, they were supposed to let it rest. According to the Levitical law, every seventh year was a sabbatical year, or what's also known as a Shemitah. And, and, and what this means is that the children of Israel, they were supposed to allow the land to rest for the entire year. They weren't supposed to work it. You know, they, they, were, they were supposed to just let you know, whatever was produced in the fields would, would be produced without any of their labor. Not only that, but the seventh year, uh, you know, that was a year when the poor would be allowed to take any produce growing in the fields. And the debts of those who owed money, well, that debt would be forgiven. And so every, every seventh year was just kind of like this year when your debt was wiped out. Wouldn't that be incredible? Let's contact the credit card companies and see what they, they think about this. But seriously, you know, the, the Israelites you know, actually ended up being exiled to Babylon for 70 years. And the reason why is because this was the number of sabbatical years that they failed to keep. So they failed to keep 70 sabbatical years and finally God said, okay, we're done. You know, I'm gonna go and force you into Babylon and you're gonna sit there for 70 years until my land gets the rest that I required. Pretty incredible. The, the post-exilic Israelites were quick then to reconfirm this commitment to the covenant because chances are they didn't want to end up back in Babylon, right? So, so they wanted to avoid the curses that, would, uh, that came upon their fathers, uh, you know, their fathers who ended up in Babylon. 
Well, as we consider their recommitment to the Sabbath laws, I want to take a moment to remind you that all of the Sabbath laws were actually pointing to the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. A lot of Christians are confused about this, and there's even people in the church who, who you know, try to tell us that we still need to keep the Sabbath law. And as, you know, I try to tell those people, I am keeping the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath law every day because I'm in Jesus Christ, and Jesus is my Sabbath rest. And so if you're in Christ, you entered into your Sabbath rest at the moment of your salvation. Jesus finished the work necessary for our salvation there on the cross, and as a result, those who trust in Jesus have entered into their Sabbath rest. Now, while it's true that every born-again believer is resting in the finished work of our Savior, it's also true that the Lord has called us to become Christians who are committed to uh, the, the fellowship that we have here within our Christian church. You know, I, I like the way that Paul put it in Hebrews chapter 10. It's there where he declared, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Christian, listen, there's a blessing for the believers who are committed to their Christian congregation. And one reason why is because the Christian who is an active member of their congregation is going to be blessed through the exhortations and the encouragements and the accountability that, that we receive as we take part in our fellowship of faith. And so while we haven't been called to keep the Sabbath law by, you know, resting on Saturday, uh, we ought to, you know, come and enjoy each other's company and, and, and the, the congregational worship that we enjoy here within our, our, our fellowship of faith every Sunday. At the same time, listen, those who begin to forsake their fellowship of faith, well, they tend to become backsliding believers. And it typically starts, you know, slowly, small, it's just, you know, little decisions, you know, uh, you know, not showing up to church every now and again, and the next thing you know, you're not showing up to church a lot, you know, or showing up to church, but sit there on, your, on the phone, you know, texting somebody, you know, that's not even here, you know, and, and oh, what, oh, sorry, I just step on some toes, but so, yeah, yeah, you're not even paying attention, you know, oh, you're here, but you're not here, you know, you're, you're you know, in communication with somebody else, you know, you, or, or, you know, hey, you know, what's the big deal showing up late? You know, we don't really have to worship together with other people. Well, that is part of it. That's part of, you know, being part of the congregation is showing up and worshiping the Lord, you know, with the rest of the church. This is important. And there's blessings that come along with it. And, you know, those who start forsaking the assembly, you know, I mean, it might be a slow process, but it's not long until you see people just making little bitty, little bitty uh, compromises along the way, and next thing you know, they're, they're back in the world. And, and if you think I'm just making up stories, I can just give you lists of names of people that I've seen go down the very same path. Just little compromises that turned into huge backsliding, and I would encourage you to, to steer clear of all of that. Well, in order to uh, avoid this quick trip back to Babylon, let's continue to consider the way that the Israelites were planning to keep the covenant. And if you would look with me again here at Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, let's pick up our study beginning at verse 32. Here at Nehemiah writes, also we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feasts, for the holy things, for the sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel, and all the work of the house of our God. Now here in these verses, we find the Israelites, uh, they're continuing to recommit themselves to the Mosaic Covenant. With this as the goal, the Israelites committed themselves to paying this temple tax, which totaled one-third of a she shekel. Now, uh, Robert Jameson points out that the law actually required every individual about 20 years of age to pay half a shekel to the sanctuary, but in consequence of the general poverty of the people occasioned by war and ca uh, captivity, this tribute was reduced to a third part of a shekel. So clearly this was a time uh, that they were uh, suffering in poverty, so they were only required to uh, produce one third of a shekel uh, every year. Now, in order to understand the purpose of this temple tax, uh, let's take another look there at the second half of verse 32. Uh, there, Nehemiah reveals that these contributions were used for the service of the house of our God. For the service of the house of, of our God. And that word service, 
It refers to all the labors that the priests and the Levites accomplished as they served the Lord there at the temple. We should also notice uh, where Nehemiah elaborates on these acts of service. It's there in verse 33. Uh, here he re refers to the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering of the Sabbath, the new moons, and the set feasts, the holy things, the sin offerings, and all the work of the house of our God. Now in this list we can see that there were these weekly observances, there were these monthly feasts, there were these yearly sacrifices, and, and all of these things uh, were gonna be funded by the congregation of Israel. And so they all chipped in so that these things could take place there at the temple. That being the case, you know, as we consider all of these things that were taking place on the daily, on the weekly, on the monthly, and on the yearly, uh, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that this temple tax wasn't the only offering that the people were commanded to present. And with this as the focus, uh, let's pick up our study of Nehemiah chapter 10. Look with me there beginning at verse 34. Here Nehemiah writes, we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God according to our father's houses at the appointed times year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord to bring the first the, uh, the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the, fir the, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. Now here in these verses we find Nehemiah referring to all these various types of first fruit offerings that the children of Israel were commanded to give to the Lord. And just to be clear here, the people were called to worship the Lord with the first fruits from their farms and from their fields and from their families. And, and in this way, they were acknowledging the fact that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. You know, when you give the first fruits of your flocks and of your fields, well, you don't know that there's going to be second fruits. You don't know that there's going to be third fruits. You know, if you, when you give up the first fruits, you're, you're walking by faith, by believing there's going to be second fruits. And there's going to be more fruit to come. And that's what they were doing. They were, they were saying, here, God, this belongs to you. It's the first fruit. And we're going to trust you for more. Now, in light of this example, we should take a moment to examine our own lives by asking, do we worship the Lord with the first fruits of our financial increase? Or do we just offer the Lord whatever's left of our paycheck at the end of the month? You know, after our vacation, after our, you know, entertainment, after, you know, the, whatever it is that we wanted to spend money, at, at the end of it all, okay, here's what's left, God. It's all yours. Go for it. Are we worshiping the Lord with the first fruits or with the leftovers? And when it comes to cutting our budget, what's the first to go? Where do we first start cutting that tight budget? Is it the entertainment budget or is it the offerings? With these questions in mind, I want to remind you that we're no longer under the law of the tithe, so I'm not trying to put you back under any law. And I'm certainly not trying to, you know, uh, come down with a legalistic trip. At the same time, though, there are blessings for those who will worship the Lord with the first fruits of their finances. That is a, you know, a spiritual principle that we find in the scriptures. I like the way that Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's there where he declares, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work." With that, I want to ask, you know, just briefly, are you reaping bountifully? Are you reaping bountifully as the Lord makes sure that you have all sufficiency in all things? Because that's the promise he makes to those who sow bountifully. So if you're reaping bountifully, it's probably because you're sowing bountifully. If you're not reaping bountifully, then the question is, did you sow bountifully? 
Please trust me when I tell you that those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. And those who worship the Lord with the first fruits of their finances will always have all sufficiency in all things as the Lord enables us to accomplish every good work. This is exactly what King Solomon was saying in Proverbs chapter 3 where he declares, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. From this, we can see that this reciprocity isn't based on some sort of sinful scheme. You know, the ones that the word faith preachers use to, to try to, you know, use your greed to get you to give more. You know, there are many people who think that, you know, they should give more to get more. Like that's their whole motivation. And that's just carnal. That's just sinful. The Lord isn't honoring people who give more to get more. No, the Lord honors those who want to honor him with the first fruits of their increase. That's the heart of the cheerful giver is just to say, God, thank you so much for what you've provided. Let me honor you with the first fruits. That's what the Lord blesses. And those who sow bountifully with that heart then reap bountifully. Well, with all this in mind, <clears throat> I want to continue to consider the example that the Israelites were setting here in our text tonight. And so look with me again here at Nehemiah chapter 10. We'll pick up our study at verse 38 where Nehemiah tells us that the priests, the descendant of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. For the children of Israel <clears throat> and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, of the new wine, and the oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we find the people of God, they're bringing their tithes to the temple, and there the priests and the Levites would collect the offerings and then store uh, everything in the storerooms uh, there at the temple, which the, the things that weren't needed immediately. And so the spiritual leaders of Israel, you know, they, uh, they, they looked for every opportunity to then use those resources for the ministry of the Lord. They, they would take and, and use this, these offerings you know, for the service of the Lord, uh, you know, to, to support the, the full-time ministers. And, and, you know, as we consider this example, I just want to point out that, you know, it's in similar fashion that we find a protocol uh, that's very much like this in the primitive church. As a matter of fact, it's actually in Acts chapter 4. There we learn that the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Now, here in these verses, you know, we find the Christians there in the first century church they're, they're bringing their excess, they're, they're bringing their financial gifts to the church uh, so that the apostles could then collect these free will offerings and then distribute the funds as anyone had need. And so it, it was the Christians who were supporting the work of the ministry with the financial offerings that they were bringing in and placing in the hands of the apostles. And then the apostles, the leaders of the church, would turn around and, and prayerfully distribute the, these offerings uh, in, in whatever way the Lord was leading to accomplish the ministry that the Lord was calling them to accomplish. And, and from this, I believe that this is a correct way for Christians to honor the Lord uh, here in the church age with the first fruits of all of our increase. We haven't been called to you know, send these offerings to the temple in Israel. This all shifts now in the church age so that you know, the, the tithes being brought to the temple, well, the, the, the continuing you know, principle of this is that Christians bring their offerings to their church and place it in the hands of the leaders to then uh, use to facilitate you know, all the ministry that the Lord wants to accomplish here within our church. The Lord is leading uh, the Christians in every church to provide the financial offerings that are necessary for accomplishing the ministry. 
the, the offerings that you guys give here, it goes to paying for rent, for, for you know, electricity, for you know, computers, for children's ministry books and curriculum and, and you know, snacks and, and all the things that need to happen here at this church. It's funded by the Christians in this church. And so with that, you know, we should kind of follow suit here you know, and, and say, okay, you know, as we worship the Lord with those first fruit offerings, let's make sure that we're placing those offerings into the hands of the leaders of our church, allowing them to be led by the Lord to basically support the work of the ministry. Now, as we begin to wrap up our study of this chapter, it's important for us to realize that there are blessings for the believers who live their life according to the instructions that we find in the word of God. Not only that, but there are corrective consequences for the Christians who choose to ignore the instructions that God has given for his church. And with that being the case, listen, I encourage every backslidden believer here tonight to recommit their lives to the Lord, much like the Israelites that we find here in our text tonight. This was a recommitment service. They they were getting together to to say, yeah, we're going to enter into the curses and the oaths of the Mosaic law. And in our recommitment to the Lord, Christian, we too ought to recognize that there is a relational reciprocity for those who follow the Lord. That we're agreeing, yes, Lord, you know, we're looking for the blessings that you promised to pour out on those who walk uh, according to your instructions. And we recognize that there will be corrective consequences if we, uh, you know, return to the flesh. With that, we ought to continue to commit our lives every day to the Lord. You know, listen, if we wake up every day and just say, Lord, I'm yours, lead me today. You know, if that's our heart every morning, just to wake up and say, Lord, just just guide me today, lead me today, help me to see your your plan for my life today. You know, if that's our heart every single morning, then listen, you can only get a day's journey away from the Lord. And so we should, we have to wake up every day and just recommit ourselves to the Lord once again so that we can live for him. And as we continue committing our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can rejoice in knowing that he will continue to pour out his blessings upon every dedicated disciple who is living their life for the Lord.